Hello, church, and blessings from Union Avenue. If you are joining our worship stream on Facebook or YouTube, please feel free to like, share, or comment during our time together. However you got here, we are glad you have joined us to give praise, to receive a good word, and to celebrate the love of Christ at his table. We will be sharing in Holy Communion this day, so take a moment to gather some communion elements that you may have in your homes if you'd like. They don't have to be bread and wine, but simply those things that help discern our common life in God. And if you prefer to watch and meditate, that's just fine. Know that you are a beloved child of God and always have a place at Christ's table among friends. And so welcome to Union Avenue and let us worship God together this day. church and happy valentine's day it's so wonderful when valentine's falls on a sunday there's really no better day to celebrate valentine's day when we already spend a portion of our sunday celebrating and honoring the unconditional love that god gives us each and every day did you know that the word love is in the Bible more than 500 times, depending on what version you read? And there is a very special verse that we see in the Bible four times. And that verse, which happens to be the most important prayer that our Jewish friends recite, goes like this. Love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, and with all your might. We first see that verse in the book of Deuteronomy, and then it's repeated three more times in the New Testament in the Gospels of Matthew, Mark, and Luke. 
So we already know how important it is to love our God with all our being. But even more than that, we see another verse that shows up multiple times that says, love your neighbor as yourself. And that means we need to love others as much as we love ourselves, even if they're strangers. We first see that verse in the book of Leviticus in the Old Testament, and then we see it multiple times in Matthew, Mark, and Luke, and in several passages in Paul's letters. So now that we know that we have to spread love all the time, and not just on days like Valentine's Day and Sundays, I want you to remember that in this really frigid, cold temperatures, the most important way you can warm someone's heart is by sharing God's love. So with that note, this week, be sure you continue the tradition of Valentine's Day and God's love. Be well, be safe, share God's love, and keep each other's hearts warm. Take care, everyone. Love ya. Happy Valentine's Day. Hello, church. Our scripture lesson for today is from the Gospel according to Mark in the first chapter, verses 40 through 45. Let anyone who has an ear listen to what the Spirit is saying to God's people. A leper came to Jesus, begging him, and kneeling, he said to him, If you choose, you can make me clean. Moved with pity, Jesus stretched out his hand and touched him and said to him, I do choose, be made clean. Immediately the leprosy left him and he was made clean. After sternly warning him, he sent him away at once, saying to him, see that you say nothing to anyone. But go, show yourself to the priest and offer for your cleansing what Moses commanded as a testimony to them. But he went out and began to proclaim it freely and to spread the word so that Jesus could no longer go into a town openly, but stayed in the country and people came to him from every quarter. These are the words of our tradition. God grant us insight. Hello everyone, and greetings to you all this Lord's Day. Have you ever had a light bulb moment? You know, one of those times where all of a sudden you realize something you had never quite comprehended before, and it changes your world. You know, if you were a cartoon character or in an animated production, you'd have a little light bulb above your head that suddenly lights up as if, aha, now I get it. It's like Archimedes crying out, Eureka, but hopefully with less public streaking involved. It's what we call having an epiphany, from the Greek word meaning a revealing or a revelation. And it's what we've been learning about since we started in the since we shared in the story of the Magi who followed a star to Bethlehem and upon encountering the presence of Christ had an epiphany and their world was changed forever. Yes, ever since that first Epiphany Sunday, we've been hearing stories throughout the first chapter of Mark's Gospel about people encountering Christ on the lake shore, having an Epiphany, and following Him. About people in the synagogue seeing firsthand the authority of Jesus to cast out oppressive forces, having an Epiphany, and realizing that this teacher bears a mighty truth about Jesus' healing miracles in the town of Capernaum, 
and having an epiphany, discovering that his mission wasn't limited to a meeting house or even just Capernaum. And today, we heard the story of Jesus cleansing a leper. Now, this story could give us several epiphanies if we looked closely at it. First, the leper, uh, the leper comes to Jesus and not the other way around. I mean, this guy believed in what Jesus could do, that his life could be turned around by him. But the text never says that he was healed because he believed in Jesus. Uh, rather, it says that Jesus healed him because Jesus was moved. Now, this is where it gets interesting. Several translations say that Jesus was moved with pity or that he had compassion for the man. But the best scholarship indicates that the original word here is orgithesis, which means became angry. This is a tough reading. We don't like it when Jesus gets angry. We prefer him on tranquilizers with a beauty sash and a sleeping lamb on his lap. But make no mistake, according to Mark, Jesus gets angry here. Why? No, not because he was interrupted or had better things to do, but because the man clearly had been turned away by the priests and by society because of his being a leper. Now, you must realize that the leprosy mentioned in the Bible is not the same as what we now call Hansen's disease, but rather can refer to any skin disorder that would make one ritually unclean, ritually unworthy to be among the people, ritually considered impure, inferior, and incapable of ever being a part of acceptable circles as defined by the religious rule of law. And if we know anything about ritual, it's a human construct and not necessarily reflective of divine intentions. Whatever actual skin problem this guy had, his real problem was being considered as less than by polite society in general and by the priests and the ruling class in specific. Why does Jesus become angry when the leper approaches? Because everyone sees the leper as a leper and not as a human being afflicted by how people perceive his skin. New Testament scholar and disciples minister, the Reverend Dr. Eugene Boring, compares biblical leprosy to a living death, physically and socially, where Levitical laws demand the person live alone, wear torn clothes, cover one's lip, and cry out to people, unclean, unclean. Being healed from biblical leprosy was akin to a resurrection as such an inflict, afflicted person had been outcast from among the living. So what does Jesus do? He violates the law and touches the man. While the priests and ruling class segregated the man from the rest of society, Jesus liberates the man from his affliction, breaks down the barriers between the man and society, religious, social, economic, political, you name it. And Jesus commands this man to go before the priests, not just as a testimony to them of what Jesus himself can do, but as a testimony to how backwards they've gotten their understanding of the kingdom of God. Commentator Gary Charles writes, In a perilous act of solidarity, instead of confirming the man's exclusion by shunning him, Jesus reaches out and symbolically draws him in. He shatters the traditional boundaries of purity and in the process rewrites the book on the nature of God's beloved community. In short, when the leper appears to Jesus, it is Jesus himself who has an epiphany, an epiphany about how unjust the world truly is, about how deeply and desperately needed is his ministry of love and life and liberation about how he and his followers need to be about the business of turning the world right side up so that no one is outcast, afflicted, oppressed, but that all are healed, 
are welcome and included and affirmed and upheld and upbuilt. And it launches a ministry that will take Jesus from Galilee to the very centers of power in Jerusalem. Can Jesus' followers today have a similar epiphany? Can we see that the ruling powers still view some people's skin as less than and construct systems of economic, social, and political segregation and suppression upon them? Can we see the racism and systemic injustice that is right before our eyes? Can we too become filled with righteous indignation and not only work to heal those so afflicted by racism, but to demand racism's end? And can we see that supremacist society has an endless array of categories for what they call unclean that deserve our rebuke? Can we see that the oppressors themselves need to be liberated from their addiction to oppressing others? The church is undergoing a time of transformation as it wrestles with the presence of systemic injustice and its own history of complacency toward it. And every expression of the church, every congregation, every collaboration of persons that makes Christ's healing, liberating presence manifest in the world needs to have an epiphany as to how best to follow Jesus in our walk of life for flourishing of people's lives right now and for the life of the world to come. The church, in all its varied expressions, is being called to missional transformation, becoming the tool God needs to effect justice and righteousness amidst inequality and oppression and suffering. And according to Mark, that sort of work gets noticed and gets a following. My friends, over the next several months, Union Avenue will be engaging with the Disciples Hope Partnership Services in their Epiphany program to help us learn how to think missionally, how to ask the right questions and keep our eyes on the prize, how to form strategic partnerships that make a difference in the community around us and form relationships that can strengthen a church's ministry and grow its presence in numbers. It's a long road to hoe, to change from the 20th century model of congregational ministry we inherited into the 21st century model of mission-oriented ministry. But we've actually been walking that road for 30 years now already without realizing it. And imagine what we can do when we put our full focus and attention toward it. Union Avenue, this year is our light bulb moment when we rediscover God's dream for the world and make it our own and make it the reason why we congregate in the first place. We're going to have an epiphany. And I, for one, can't wait to see our future unfold with hope and courage and strength for a renewal. Be smart, be safe, and be well. My love be with you all in Christ Jesus. Amen.
Covenant House is the perfect place for any youth that is vulnerable, homeless, or need any help with anything. Covenant House is a welcoming home for youth who are experiencing homelessness in the St. Louis region. We work with youth 16 to 24 years old. They could come in for therapy services, case management, if they need help with employment, even if they just need to take a shower, have a meal, do laundry. Whatever their needs are, we try to meet them where they're at. Since I was 13, it started when I was 13, in and out of jail, like messing my life up. My mom had two strokes. She was in the hospital for a while, then she moved to a nursing home. And my dad is not in my life. So I feel like the Covenant House really do fill that void. When a youth first comes in, we make sure their basic needs are met first. It's hard to focus on anything if maybe you haven't slept or showered or eaten in a couple days. We have a 24-hour intake process where we'll come in, we'll evaluate the youth, see what their needs are at that point. The therapy team within two to three days tries to connect with each youth that comes in and let them know what resources in terms of mental health we offer here. We work with the youth within our program, our residents. We have multiple programs. We have our Garden Ranger program that takes youth out into the community and help them learn job readiness skills, work ethics, attitude, communication, time management. They get to practice that by showing up every morning and then they can add that on their resume. We do uh, blended learning, job readiness curriculum. That allows you to go online and learn professional dress, uh, work ethics, interviewing, applications, time management. And then we come together as a group to make sure that everyone got the same amount of understanding out of that training. We are the only housing option for youth experiencing homelessness within the city of St. Louis. It is so much more than a shelter. They may have never experienced someone that truly loves them. So having the unconditional love is really important. My life actually changed a lot because now I can look at a different perspective and honestly say that there's really people out there to help. They need to just put a heart on the door and just say it's love for it. Like when I first came here, everybody just thought attacking me with love. And I'm just like, whoo. <laughs> so I'm like, okay, I got to get used to these people actually caring. Investing in our younger generations has a huge payoff down the road because they will be the ones taking care of us, taking care of our communities, and we need to be the people that help them get there. You never know who, how many lives you can save, and this program definitely saving lives. Hello, church. Thank you for joining me in spirit here at this table and for letting me share with you at yours. If you have communion elements, make sure they are ready at this time. Holy Communion is known by many names, among them the Great Thanksgiving, because here we give thanks for the gifts of life and love from God that we celebrate in bread and cup. But we also give thanks for the many gifts we all bring to Christ's table in the generosity of our time, our talents, and our resources by which we extend God's feast of justice and shalom throughout the world. And so, as we come to the table today, thank you for making the communion feast possible. Not just what we do today, but each and every day we make a difference in the world in the name of Jesus Christ and as far as our ministries together may reach. May God bless and multiply the many gifts given for the life of the world to come. We remember how when Jesus gathered with his disciples to celebrate the Passover and remember the promises of God, he took the bread, blessed it, broke it, and gave it to his disciples, saying, This is my body, given for you. Every time you eat of it, remember me. In like manner, after the supper, Jesus took the cup, saying, This cup is the covenant renewed, my love poured out for you and for all, for the forgiveness of all sin. Every time you drink of this, remember me. We are one bread, one body, 
one cup of blessing, though we are many scattered throughout the earth. And so, wherever you are, whatever elements you have gathered, rest your hands lightly upon these elements as a sacrament, or simply rest your hearts in the presence of our gracious host as we ask God's blessing upon them. Holy God, you take the common and make them holy. As we eat and drink of these common things that you have made holy this day, take us and make us holy too. In Christ, amen. And now, would you pray with me the Lord's Prayer, using whatever words are familiar to you. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our debts, as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever and ever. Amen. Let us break bread together. The bread of life, broken for us. and the cup of love poured out for us. Let us pray. Holy God, thank you for this feast. We know that you love us. Help us be good and love other people too for the life of your world to come. In Jesus' name, amen. Thank you for sharing with me in this feast. Friends in Christ, 
Go forth from our time together in worship to serve God with gladness. Be of good courage. Hold fast to that which is good. Render no one evil for evil. Strengthen the faint-hearted. Support the weak. Help the afflicted. Honor all. Love and serve the Lord, rejoicing in the power of the Holy Spirit and the grace of Jesus Christ, the love of God, and the communion of the Holy Spirit be with you all now and forevermore. Amen.